welcome everyone. I'm Caitlin Cusack. I'm a forester uh, and I'm joined tonight by the rest of the forest, the forestry team, Peter Van Lund, David McMath, and Daniel Kilborn. And tonight we're going to cover um, uh, the hardwood species for any of you who might have chimed in to the uh, winter tree ID. We're going to cover some of those hardwood species, but we're going to share about the leaves and fruit. Uh, and then we're going to introduce a new set of conifers. Um, so hopefully we'll leave, we'll leave you with some good tricks uh, for identifying trees in our woods. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who is going to kick us off by reviewing some tree ID basics. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. And uh, good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Kilborn. I'm a VLT forester working in the northeast part of the state, calling in tonight from Island Pond. Like Caitlin said, we wanted to start with some uh, some some basic tree ID that we think will be helpful as we walk through these different species tonight. So uh, branching pattern, since we'll be talking about leaves, we wanna describe how these might be oriented on the branch um, and they will be found in a certain pattern. They're either opposite, which means they're located directly across from one another or they're alternate, which means they are staggered on the twig species are either going to be uh, alternate or opposite that doesn't change between species. Uh, a trick to remember the opposite trees is the mnemonic MADCAP horse, which stands for, um, well, MAD stands for maple, ashes, and dogwoods. CAP stands for the Caprifoliaceae family, which is mostly shrubs and vines. And uh, horse stands for horse chestnut. Um, next, We'll talk a little bit about some leaves uh, and hardwoods. Leaves are either going to be a simple or compound. And a simple leaf, like you can see on the top left, is a, is a single leaf that is not divided into smaller parts. It's always attached to the twig by a stem or a petiole where it originates near the bud. A compound leaf uh, is divided into many smaller parts called leaflets. These are uh, attached by by that petiole to, uh, sorry, not by the petiole, the leaflets are attached by a, peti a petiole to the, to the main vein, uh, called, this time called a rachis, which then transitions back to the petiole um, where it connects to the twig. Um, there's different types of compound leaves, but we're not gonna go that deep tonight. We're just gonna leave it at the fact that uh, some, are, some are simple, some are compound. If you're unsure if you're looking at a leaf or a leaflet, Locate the side bud on the branch because um, all the leaves, whether they're simple or compound, will have a bud node at the place that that petiole attaches to the twig. And on a compound leaf, you can expect that the bud node is at the base of each um, stem, but no bud node at the base of each leaflet. And we'll see some more examples of that. Um, some common parts of the leaves, we already talked about the leaf stem, the petiole. Um, leaves also have veins. Um, and they can have different venation patterns, which can be important. Um, margins of the leaves or the edges can have different characteristics. They may be smooth or they may be wavy. They may have teeth on them, uh, meaning that there's jagged edges, or they may have lobes, uh, meaning that there's deep valleys along the edge of the leaf, like these sugar maples in the, in the lower right here. Um, and we don't want to forget about our conifers. Um, these are the softwoods we'll be talking about tonight. Um, conifers also have leaves. Uh, we just happen to call them needles. Um, they're also considered evergreens because they generally uh, don't drop their leaves in the fall and they appear green year round. Um, we'll keep it simple tonight. Um, we'll think of uh, these three basic categories, comb-like, which will be the spruces and firs, scale-like, which will be cedar, and needle-like, which will be the pines. And we'll see examples of each of these. So um, for a little practice, and because we didn't have time to fit aspen into our lineup tonight, uh, we'll look at some aspen leaves and highlight some of the features we just discussed. So here we have four aspen species. Um, they all have simple leaves. So it's just one leaf, no leaflets. You can see the petiole on each, which will attach the leaf to the branch. And fun fact, uh, in Aspen, the petiole uh, in many of them is flat and not round, 
which allows the leaf to tremble or quake in the wind, hence the name for the common aspen species, uh, trembling aspen. We can see some different shapes here starting to stand out too, right? Uh, the cottonwood is very triangular. If we draw a line around that big tooth leaf, uh, we'll see it's nearly round. Um, and check out the margins. None of these are smooth. You can really see uh, the teeth on some of them uh, with big tooth really living up to its name here with those, with those large uh, teeth. Um, and lastly, as we can see in the, in the white poplar, which by the way is uh, not native here, um, we start to see the development of some lobes or those, uh, or those valleys that can form along the margins. So with that ID, let's, uh, let's get right into our focus species. So tonight um, I'll be reviewing the ash species from the last webinar um, with special attention to the leaves. Uh, and we're also gonna meet Northern white cedar. And on the, on the side photos here, we can see ash and cedar standing tall. Uh, and in the center, we can see that they also mix. Um, we have a black ash uh, sitting in the canopy among some cedar trees. Uh, and the way we want to introduce these trees tonight uh, is to visit some specific places. And we're going to visit uh, Northwood Stewardship Center first. It's way up in the northeastern part of the state. This image is uh, taken from the VLT recreation map, which can be found on our website, uh, linked right off the homepage. Um, this map highlights properties that VLT has helped to protect. And each of these green icons is a place that provides um, a great recreational opportunity. So all the properties that we're talking about tonight can be found on this map. Um, and you can use it to, to get more information about the location and access and what type of activities are allowed there. And we thought it would be fun to link each group of species to a place that you can go explore on your own. So uh, here's Northwoods, Northwood Stewardship Center, a, a nonprofit uh, focused on education for stewardship and youth leadership through their Conservation Corps. Um, part of their 1500 acre campus contains the uh, Lydia Spitzer Demonstration Forest where VLT holds a conservation easement. Um, and tonight, we're gonna uh, focus on the west side of the property uh, and visit the Echo Lake uh, East Shore Trail. We'll find parking here off of East Echo Lake Road at a trailhead uh, with a short trail, really probably, I think it's about four tenths of a mile leading down to Echo Lake. And when we get here, we're gonna find perfect conditions for a mixture of northern white cedar, black ash, white ash on some of the drier hummocks. And these are gonna be mixed in with uh, their associates, balsam fir, red spruce, black cherry, and aspen. Um, and these species are gonna really thrive here because of the soils. This place is dominated by cabot soils, uh, which are really quite variable, but are defined by a, a shallow hard pan depth which means that the water can't uh, drain out of the soil and it's gonna be quite moist, often wet, uh, which, are, which are gonna be perfect for, uh, for our, our ashes and um, cedar tonight. So uh, we're gonna find both white and black ash here, probably not green ash because of its location in the Northeast part of the state, but we're gonna keep that in the mix for review for the folks that um, might find it nearby. And I do quickly want to remind folks that uh, emerald ash borer does impact all three of these species. Um, and we can see the blonding and some of the gallery impacts on this photo in the lower right. Um, more information here uh, can be found um, in the last, in the last uh, Tree ID webinar over the winter. And uh, we'll also link to a, a previous uh, webinar that we did on um, ash tree monitoring. So the bark, um, all these species can start out pretty bland when they're young. You can see that young ash bark on the right looking pretty inconspicuous. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as they mature, they start to develop uh, a little bit of uh, some feature. Uh, White and green ash can still be tough. Uh, mature trees will have uh, ridges or fissures that tend to take on diamond shapes. 
feel like green ash might have a little bit more of a finely laced pattern. Um, but a lot of this really depends on the site conditions of where the tree grows, because um, as we've touched on, bark characteristics can be heavily influenced by tree vigor and growth rate. Um, in black ash, uh, it is much different. It's uh, flaky and has corky bark that's often spongy to the touch. If you find a good one, like uh, the one that uh, someone's grabbing here in the photo, um, it's just hard not to start uh, pinching it. And sometimes I feel like my kids, when they get a hold of uh, uh, a sheet of bubble wrap. On to the ash leaves. So, They are compound. Um, this means that the whole thing here is one leaf and they're typically made up of five to nine leaflets. White ash uh, has, tends to have clearly stalked leaflets, which means you can see that petiole connecting the leaflets to the main stalk. Uh, and white ash tend to have lighter colored white undersides, which you can see in the inset near the white ash leaf on the left. Um, and this is how they got their name, white ash. And these leaflets tend to have smooth margins. The leaflets of uh, green ash have shorter stalks connecting them to the main stem. And uh, the undersides are darker without that whitish appearance. And the margins are finely toothed. And then uh, for black ash, the leaflets are actually considered sessile, which means they have no stalk. They're almost connected uh, directly to that petiole, the main, uh, the main stem there, the rachis. Um, and they also lack that conspicuous uh, whitened undersurface. Uh, black ash tends to have more leaflets, seven to 11, you often see them uh, with nine. Um, and the shape can really vary as with all these species. Um, in this photo, they're pretty oval, but they can also be uh, a little longer and skinnier. And on um, black ash, the, the, the margins are um, toothed with small incurved teeth. And that brings us to uh, the northern white cedar, so also known as abravitae. You may be familiar with the cultivar that's used in cedar hedges, very common. Um, but in the woods, it's a medium-sized tree that can uh, grow upwards of 50 feet tall. Uh, it can be found on a variety of sites, dry bluffs along lakes, uh, coming into old abandoned uh, pastures. But it's most common in the northeast on these moist soils and forested wetlands. Um, where it can form these really magical northern white cedar swamps. If, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, author, uh, Howard Frank Mosier, some of his books uh, really well describe the wild feeling that these places can evoke. Uh, the bark here on uh, northern white cedar uh, is kind of pale brown. It can be stringy and fibrous in appearance and sometimes looks like it's shredding off the trees. Uh, squirrels and some birds um, actually use this as nesting material. I've been told that that's because it has uh, antimicrobial properties. Um, the leaves are really the key identifying feature uh, for northern white cedar, and it's that, that leaf structure. They look like little scales. Um, they form these tight rows along the twig called sprays. Um, it does hold these needles all year round, so is an evergreen. That is, uh, if it can get through winter without being browsed by deer, because it is a preferred uh, winter deer food. Um, and also came in handy for early explorers when Native Americans show them how to ward off scurvy by making cedar tea. Also has uh, cones. Uh, they're egg-shaped. They sit upright on the branch. Um, they're pollinated. Uh, and begin growing in late June and ripen in later, later in the summer. Uh, they're about a third to a half an inch long and they turn this uh, dark cinnamon brown at maturity. So with that, um, hope you can take some time to get up to East Shore Trail at Northwoods in Charleston. Uh, and maybe as you end your walk, you can sit on this Leopold bench uh, near the lake and enjoy the company of the white cedar. So before I turn it over to uh, David, I, th I think I'll take a few questions. Yeah, we've got a couple questions for you, Dan. Um, one was, what was the name of the author mentioned in reference to the Northern White Cedar? 
Yeah, that's Howard Frank Mosier, um, a local author up in the Northeast Kingdom, wrote a number of books. Um, folks might enjoy checking some of those out. And Michael wants to know, Thuga family, question mark? Yes, that's right. Um, these are actually um, not considered true cedars, but new world uh, cedars, different different uh, genus than the junipers uh, and uh, red cedar. And Michael had another question. Uh, looks like Caitlin was gonna answer this one live. Um, not sure exactly what his question was, but it says world sub opposite to, uh, maybe he was trying to get at the fact that there are also arrangements where the branches are whorled or they all come out <clears throat> around or needles come out around all sides of the egg and there are sub opposite um, branching patterns as well. well um, I don't think we have any of those in our program tonight though. Did you have more to add, Kaylin? No, oh, no, that's it, Peter. I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned Michael's comment. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, uh, uh, what was your acronym for identifying hardwoods? Oh yeah, that so <laughs> right for determining which which uh, species are opposite. It was mad cap horse. So mad for maple ash and dogwood, which is the most relevant for our species in Vermont. Uh, and a couple of people have been asking about ash and EAB. And I think rather than take a bunch of time talking about what the appropriate thing is to do tonight, um, we will include that in our follow-up email. We'll give you some resources. Um, suffice it to say, there's no need to panic. Uh, the ash are doing fine. And we've got some good recommendations for how to manage them. Um, also, we will, this is being recorded and we'll send out a link to the recording. Someone said that they had to leave early. So uh, you will get a link to the full recording. I think now we should probably move on to David's. All right. Um, thanks, Dan and Peter. And I'd also like to welcome everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a group of hardwood trees that are significant to the wildlife and several softwood trees that are two of my favorites. Um, so it'd be the red and white oak, American beech and white and red pine. Um, before I launch into the tree idea, I'd just like to draw your attention to um, the Bluffside farm. Um, you can, there we go. And not too far away from the Northwood Center. Um, it's located on Lake Memphis Magog in the city of Newport. Um, VLT purchased it in 2015 and it was the largest undeveloped property within the city. Uh, it has a nice mix of farmland, a couple small wetlands, woodland, and over a thousand feet of sandy beach lakeshore. So with the sandy soils and the moderating winter temperatures from the lake, it has a variety of tree species and uh, it's open to the public, lots of uh, trails out there, and uh, you'll find the trees that I'm gonna talk about. Um, before I jump into the specific oaks, I just wanna give a little background. Um, under the genus Corcus, there's over 400 species. Um, thankfully, Vermont only has 11 native oak species, and white and red are, are among those. I find the oaks pretty confusing. And so I know in the last talk also um, talked about what I like to do is just divide it into a red or white family. So very easy. Um, just think about the red oak on the lobes, they're pointed. And on the white oak, which we'll see in a minute, they're rounded. So if you can take a look at the leaf in this, um, there's a lot of different variety uh, amongst them, but if it's got points, it's in the red oak family. Um, just to go over the bark real quick, um, the bark is sort of tight. It's, um, uh, it's dark, um, sometimes gray. And I find on the older trees, often you'll find lichen on it, which is a great, um, little key there. 
Um, sometimes you'll see sort of long silvery lines going down between sort of the bark furrows and people refer to these as little ski trails. Um, if you damage the bark, it's um, got sort of a pinkish tinge to it and there's a strong sort of red oak smell or, you know, maybe it's a tannin smell. I'm not sure how to describe it. Um, the leaves typically um, have seven to 11 lobes, but again, I, I find a lot of variety in those. Um, and as I, as I find the oak in the forest, it tends to be a stately tree. It kind of stands out. So if you're, you know, walking through and you see a large, um, big tree, nine times out of 10, it's a, it's a red oak. Um, you know, you can certainly just tell the difference between that and a sugar maple pretty easily. Um, the branching pattern, you can kind of see it on the slide on the left there. That's a oak in our backyard. It's, um, they're really thick branching. Um, I should have probably put a maple next to it, which has a much finer branching pattern. So that's another dead giveaway. Um, the Northern Red Oak likes, it likes a little warmer. Like we don't find a lot of it in the Northeast Kingdom, especially at the higher elevations, but along the lakes, um, you know, around Burlington, as you go farther south, um, it likes deep, well-drained soils, um, sandy soils, those kind of things. Find it with uh, white pine. We'll talk a little bit about uh, more. The other thing is the acorn on these. Um, I always think of the red oak acorn as having a cap versus the white oak, which has more of a cup, which we'll see in a minute. Something David, it there? looks like... Yep, we're back. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, the other thing on the acorns, which is kind of cool, is um, you need roughly 500 acorns to get one that will produce a one-year-old seedling. So in other words, they're popular food. Okay, so we have, you know, insects, squirrels, rodents, deer, turkey, bears, birds, all sorts of things that, that use these, these acorns as food. Um, so, you know, you get a, on a year that's not a great acorn crop, you won't get any seedlings out of it because um, they're all being eaten. So it's, um, it can be a difficult one to regenerate sometimes. There's a lot of planting that goes on, um, but it's a great, you know, great wildlife tree and it's a great lumber tree too for timber and stuff. All right, let's... Um, Jam into white oak. Um, so white oak is Quercus alba, and it means fine tree in Latin. Um, talk about the bark on this. It's definitely a gray, a gray sort of whitish bark. Um, the sort of scaly ridges and plates that can be overlapping. Um, on the older trees, the bark will actually start peeling off a little bit. Um, not like a shag bark hickory where you have big pieces coming off, but just enough. I mean, a lot of times enough for like a, um, a little brown bat and those kind of things that can roost under those. Um, again, I didn't mention with the red oak, but um, similar with the white oak, that the leaves are kind of a thick, heavy leaf. Um, they take a long time to uh, decompose and they're also very persistent. So they'll be, they'll hold on well into the winter. Um, I know our oak tree, if we get one of those wet snows, early snows, it'll get a lot of branch breakage because of that. Um, uh, let's see. The, uh, like the, like the red, um, they're again, they're a pretty stately tree out in the, out in the forest and um, they kind of stand out. I find the branching pattern is not as thick and heavy, but it can be very gnarly looking. Um, if you look at the leaf, you can see um, it's a similar size, um, usually not as many lobes as the red, but the big thing is they're rounded, they're smooth. There's no, no point on that. Um, and then a, the acorn, that's a great picture of the acorn. It's, you can see that it's, it's a more of a cup versus a cap and uh, a good way if you can only find the acorn if the tree's real big. Um, I think of the red oak, like say, oh, there's a red oak, red oak forest or red oak, white pine forest. I don't think of white oak as being a white oak forest. I know there's some around, but the ones I've seen or when I find white oak in Vermont, 
Um, they're more a solitary tree. They're widely scattered throughout the forest. Um, so that's another, another key. Um, okay, let's jump into the beach. Again, the beach um, to me is, is very straightforward. It's that smooth, pale gray bark is an unmistakable characteristic. The bark is thin, it, it wounds easily. So again, if the bear is, bears are trying to climb up to get some of the acorns, I mean, the, the beech nuts, um, you'll see their claw marks and they'll last for, for years. People like to you know, carve their names and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so once you see this um, tree, I think it'll be no problem um, to ID it. The other thing on the leaf is it has, um, it's pretty distinctive. It's the elliptical shape with this parallel um, venation on it, the veins. And you can see the, the slide in the, in the group of three there, very prominent there. And that's uh, another um, good key. And also on the edge, it's actually called doubly serrated. So that is a rough edge on there. And you really need a magnifying glass. You'll see that it's double toothed on there. Um, and then obviously the beech nut, uh, very distinct. Um, and as with a lot of other trees, unfortunately, the beech is susceptible to beech bark disease, which I don't have time to go into. You can easily Google it up. But the slide to the right uh, or to the left there with all the little pop marks on it, that's, that's a pretty common sight when you're out in the forest looking at beech trees. If we find a tree on the left, like on the left, it's smooth. Certainly we want to protect those. Usually, you know, it might be, not, it might have um, just been missed by the, the scale insect or um, it's got some natural defense against it. So, and also I read today that the beach is the holder of knowledge. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, let's jump into the white and red pine. So, I think most people know the white pine. Um, it certainly played a, a huge, a huge role in our development and our economy in New England. I mean, this started back in the early 1600s when Europe didn't have masts for their boats. And if that was a 24 inch uh, white pine within three miles of the coast, it got marked as a King's arrow pine. Um, so it started then most of the accessible sort of virgin white pine was cut um, probably mid 1800s and then probably peak around 1900, early 1900s in, in lumber production. But it's still a very important um, species in the overall economy and for boards and those kind of things. Um, the needles or the leaves, which we call needles, um, are usually three to five inches long uh, bluish green, a little white on the underside sometimes. Um, they're flexible, they're kind of soft feeling, and they're always in bundles of five. So that's kind of the key if you're, if you're forgotten. The other stuff is if it's got five little needles in this little bundle, um, then that's the white pine. The bark, I don't have the bark of a young tree. I realize um, that's usually smooth green um, in color but it quickly gets into this sort of rougher, um, dark to black um, characteristic bark. And on the older trees can be very platy, um, very thick looking. Um, the also the, the older trees, like the one on the left, they become very um, sort of irregular and picturesque on the, on the crown. And in fact, on the bluff side farm, there's, um, there's an eagle nest in one of the white pines. Um, they, they're susceptible to it's kind of those wet snowstorms or wind and stuff, so branches will break off and stuff. But um, from a distance, you start recognizing these and you can see, um, you can pick them out of the landscape. Um, the cones, real quick, are um, 40 inches long. Um, they're cylindrical. They're, they're um, really tight before they mature. Um, it takes two years for them to mature. So sort of the end of the second year and sort of late summer, early fall, they'll start releasing their seeds. So from a forestry perspective, if you're planting a harvest, you want to regenerate white pine, you have to time it with a good seed year. And those are, you know, three to five years, um, depending, and you can watch them and it's, it's, you'll see the tops of the trees there. They'll just be loaded with the pines. It's, it's quite easy. 
to tell. Um, the white pines grow in pure stands, mixed stands. Um, you find them with red oak commonly, uh, which you would find up at bluff side, but you can have white ash, hemlock, maples, you know, beech and all that. They are also susceptible to disease called blister rust. And again, um, Google it up. There's tons of, of information about it. Um, and they're, you know, they're a popular yard tree in plantations. The blister rust can cause a lot of problems. Um, and let's see. Okay, let's jump to the red pine. Um, red pine's an interesting one. I never knew red pines were native to Vermont, um, but they are. They're not a, you know, they're a small part of our natural forest mix, usually growing in warmer pockets. Um, so it's, you know, can be some Southern Canada down to mid-Atlantic states. Um, but starting in the 1920s and probably running through the 60, uh, 1960s, red pine was promoted and planted all over Vermont, um, first by the CCC crews and then later sort of the state soil bank program, federal cost share, those kind of things. So typically you find the red pine in plantations and, um, you know, there'll be a pure stand and they're designed to, you know, to grow, to be thinned and then, um, you know, eventually cut down. They're great. Um, they're seen as an ideal tree to reclaim depleted soils on old farmland fields, um, stabilize the road of hillsides. And, you know, there's some provide farmers or landowners a cash crop down the road. Of course, that's, you know, decades, not years. Um, they're pretty hardy, not susceptible to a lot. Uh, the bark is very distinct. It's sort of a flaky reddish uh, bark. And you see that picture on the left that the um, some people describe the the needle or the branches as sort of pom pom like, um, and they're not real thick. It's sort of like you can kind of see through the crowns and those kind of things. Um, so the leaf or the needle is um, unlike the white pine is found in clusters of two. It's a longer needle typically, and it's also uh, more brittle. It's a thicker, thicker needle. So if you went to crunch it in your hand, it would break. Um, and let's see, the cone is a smaller cone and um, it's a tight, hard cone, not real long and similar to the white pine. Um, you know, it takes, takes a couple of years there to, to mature, drop the seed and usually on a three to seven year cycle. Um, so just to recap, we have red oak has pointed on the, on the lobes. White oak is rounded. We have white pine has a cluster of five needles. The red pine has a cluster of two. And the American beech has a distinct smooth gray bark. And I think there's one more slide, Dan. And this is up on bluff side. And you can see we've got kind of the, we've got a red oak. Um, there to the left and you've got the white pine in the distance, you can see some pine clusters. So um, certainly encourage you to head up there. If you wanna take a look, walk around um, and uh, maybe take a swim in the lake. Great David, thanks. We got a few questions for you. Oh boy. Um, one of them is, can you describe how to ID very young regeneration? I sometimes see what I think are oak seedlings and seem to have no lobes. I'm not sure how to ID how to mm. ID them. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to think. We have some young ones growing out here, and they all, you know, I can tell just by the leaf. Um, you could certainly get in there with a magnifying glass and probably try to look at the bark. I mean, the you know the twig and stuff, but. Um, Maybe you just have to wait. I, I don't know if either anyone else has any ideas, but when yeah, trees are so they're so young like that, it's really hard, hard to tell. Um, yeah, when they're really young, you just kind of have to wait until they pop out a leaf that yeah. that you can distinguish. Okay, here's another one. Um, Kate says she thinks she has a red oak growing out of an old stump. In the last few years, it shot up to twelve to fifteen feet. It has more than one trunk. Should she cut them out? If so, will she end up with more shoots? 
She also finds little trees starting all over her garden and woody areas, but hasn't seen acorns. So do these spread through the roots? Yeah, I believe, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think the red oak is a can stump sprout. Do you guys know that? Yeah, it can stump sprout. I don't think it's root it sprouts. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if they're oaks, yeah, it's always tough when you get a tree that's got multi-stem like that, uh, especially when they're young. Um, but you can certainly try cutting one of them and putting all the energy into one stem. Um, it just, it's hard because rot can get into that other one and sometimes make it weak. Um, if they're popping up around the garden and all that, I, there might be a different tree species on that one. So Yeah, if they're popping up, it also might be that uh, some forgetful squirrel or chipmunk or blue yeah. jay dropped an acorn and right. forgot to go back for it over the winter. Yeah. Um, so here's another one. Um, Kelsey would like to know, what is red and white describing the color of the wood? Uh, good question. Yeah, I mean, I would have to look at the official answer up, but that's what I kind of think of. The 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 boards on on the red oak is um, does have a reddish color to it, and the white um, is obviously much whiter. The red oak is a more porous wood, um, and the white oak they is is not, so they can use the white oak for barrels. It's, you know, it's a popular um, wood for you know the whiskey makers and all that. Um, so, but there might be more, a more official answer out there, but. Right. Um, Great. And, uh, for the red and white pine, it does not describe the wood. Those are both white. The wood right. is white on both of those. Um, one more question, quick one. How tall the red pine get? Oh boy. Um, they can push a hundred feet on those, um, uh, red pine real quick is, um, especially up this way or more in New York state is um, they make, use that for telephone poles. So it's a, a real strong pole market um, for that. So they'll, um, they'll use those. So no, they'll get right up there and they can live 200 plus, you know, 250 years old if, if in the right site. So uh, Great. Thanks, David. Okay. Um, Val, Val pointed out that one thing that she, she uses to help uh, remember white pine is there are five letters in the word white and huh. five needles in a fascicle, five in a gotcha. clump of uh, pine needles, white yeah. pine needles. Oh. I mean, yeah, that's that, great. Val? That's great. And I guess it's my turn. All right. Uh, so my name's Peter Van Loan. I cover the Southern four counties for VLT, and I'm going to talk about spruce and fir and the associated birches. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that uh, the place I'd like you to come check out is Hogback Mountain in uh, southern Vermont, in my hometown of Marlboro. It's an old ski area. It's about 600 acres and is bisected by uh, Route 9. It's got really great access, lots of trails all over the place. Um, in the northern part of the property, you'll find lowland spruce fir, and on the southern part on Mount Olga and down low, you'll find what is sort of approximates a montane uh, spruce fir, and down low again, uh, there's some more uh, lowland spruce fir, and with those, you'll have all the uh, all the birches that I'm going to describe. So it's a great place to um, hike around and try out your new skills. Um, if we go to the next slide. So the birch leaves I find, you know, David said that he finds, I think the oaks confusing and I find the birches and the spruces really confusing. One thing is the birch leaves look a lot like leaves of other trees. Um, so it's really important to not just look at the leaves, but also to look at the bark as well. But we'll look quickly at the leaves of uh, four birch trees that I'm going to talk about tonight. The paper birch um, has kind of a, a round shape and it has that funky little uh, pointed tip that bends a little bit at the top and the serration, the teeth are uh, sort of uneven around the outside. Uh, when we go over to the, the yellow birch leaf, that one is more elongated or lanceolate 
again, unevenly serrated. It's actually looks unlike what you see here in front of you. They can be very similar to the, um, <clears throat> well, the, the leaf for a uh, black birch. Um, they're actually pretty similar in shape, but when you crush the black birch leaves, a handful of them, you get kind of a sweet odor out of them. They also have a much finer serration and it's a little bit more regular. The one that's really easy is the, is the gray birch. It's triangular shaped. It has sort of that stair step lobes uh, going up to the tip. So uh, that one you'll generally find in drier sort of woodland edges. Um, that's pretty easy to ID. Well, let's look at the bark on these. <clears throat> we'll start with a yellow birch. The name says it all. If you see any yellow or gold in the bark, it's yellow birch. It has thin uh, plates of bark or strips of bark that peel off. When it gets older, as that bottom sort of center photo shows, it gets a little blockier. The bark does and a little darker. It's similar to the black birch just to the right of it. Although still you can see there's a little bit of a yellowish tinge to it. Um, black birch has thick plates of bark. Uh, gray, grayish black. Um, it's similar to black cherry that you see there on the right, but the black cherry plates are really uh, much thinner. They can they'll flake right off, um, whereas the black birch are thick and they'll hold on tight. Uh, let's move on to the white birches. Paper birch is the one that everybody knows. It's got big wide sheets of bark that peel off. Um, and gray birch looks very similar, although the bark can look a little dirty and it doesn't really strip at all in, in sheets. It's more just sort of a little bit of flaking. But the thing that really gives gray birch away is those black triangles just below where the branches come into the, to the trunk. That's a dead giveaway that you're looking at gray birch. Oh, that's a, that's a, quick run through the birches. If you want more, uh, you can go back and look at the February Winter Tree ID uh, webinar that we did. We'll send a link to that on our follow-up email as well. Let's move on to the spruces. So in Vermont, I think, well, let me start again. Um, the spruces I find really confusing. And so one thing that helps me figure out what they are is knowing where I am in the landscape. If you're in the northern, say, quarter of Vermont, you will see white spruce. If you are south of that, it is unlikely that you're going to see white spruce. If you're on the hogback property, you're not going to see white spruce. Um, so just sort of keep that in mind. Where you are, depending on where you are in Vermont, that's going to cut down the number of spruce species you need to keep track of. So let's go down to the next slide. Another thing that can be helpful is sort of the growth form of the, of the various um, <clears throat> spruces. Uh, red and white are fairly similar. Some people think that the white is, um, or actually it, it can be, especially um, up in the northern part of the state, it can be sort of similar, a conical or pyramidal shape to the balsam fir seen on the left there. Um, but the balsam fir is more pointed. The, the white uh, spruce will tend to have longer branches that droop a little bit. The black birch is a dead giveaway. It has a lot of foliage sort of clumped at the top and then it'll have big gaps in other places. Um, and as you can see, the black uh, generally is on wet sites. So stream sides, lake sides, swamps, that sort of place is where you'll find uh, the black spruce Red spruce and balsam fir are a little bit more generalists. So you'll find them on wet or dry sites. Um, white spruce tends to be a dry site species. Uh, it's pretty typical to find it on old pasture sites in the north. Um, another thing about uh, white spruce, we'll see on the next slide. Um, oh, I guess got ahead of myself a little bit there. Uh, let's look at a few more identifying characteristics. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead, Dan. Um, uh, the needles, as you can see, 
they can all be anywhere from a half inch to an inch. Uh, black can be a little smaller. White maybe can be a little longer. Um, but it can be a little difficult to tell. So there are a few things in this chart that'll help you sort of do in on what exactly it is. Um, for the cones, uh, the white spruce has a much longer cone. It's generally about two inches long. It's cylindrical. And when it opens up, it has really soft, flexible scales, whereas the, the red and the black spruce have pretty rigid scales. The black spruce, the dead giveaway on that one is the edges of the cone scales are toothed. None of the other ones have that. Red spruce might have the odd little sort of cut out of it, but it's not toothed like the black spruce is. And the twigs, as you can see, there's sort of a, a gradient of, of hairiness that we'll see in the next slide, but that's uh, a really good way to tell the difference between these. If you go to the next one, Dan, um, you see on the right there, the black spruce twig is really hairy. There's a lot of little white hairs there. On the left, the red spruce, you can see a few. Uh, there's a few black ones towards the bottom and a few white ones a little higher up to the right, whereas the white spruce has no hairs whatsoever. It's absolutely smooth. So if you have a hand lens or you have better eyes than I do, look at the, the twigs and how hairy they are, and that'll help you identify your spruces species. Uh, so the next one I think will, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of before. So um, these big burls, I've never seen them on anything but a white spruce. Uh, maybe if Dan or Caitlin or David had seen them on other species, they can correct me. But whenever I see these, these are on white spruce. So that can be another uh, identifying character. So let's move on to the next slide. We're gonna look at the balsam fir now. The spruce needles are really kind of like needles for the most part. They're, they're fairly rigid, they're really sharp. As you can see, the one that I'm holding uh, on the left, I'm pushing down. They're not really bending, they're sort of poking into my finger. They're pretty sharp. The spruce, or excuse me, the fir needles to the right they're pretty flexible. They bend right over when I put a little bit of pressure on them. Um, but the real key and another really important identifying characteristic can be seen in the next slide. And that is all the spruces, the needles are not attached directly to the twig. There's a little wooden peg that they're attached to. And you can see that in this picture of the white spruce. Needles come down and there's a little wooden stem that they're uh, attached to, whereas the balsam fir is actually, actually attached right to the, the twig itself. It kind of almost looks like a suck. Um, the balsam fir, you can see uh, on the needle there, it also has uh, sort of a two white racing stripes, they call them, on the underside. That's uh, the same as hemlock that has the same sort of trait, uh, but uh, the difference between the two is the needle length. Balsam fir needles are generally about an inch long and the uh, hemlock needles are much. So I think that's about it for me, Dan. I think there's maybe one more placeholder slide. Oh, the bark, right. How could I forget? <laughs> so uh, the bark is sort of a, um, is again, sort of a gradient for the spruces. The picture on the left is fairly typical. That's actually red spruce, but on the one with the big burls that has um, a little bit shaggier uh, plated bark than that. Um, that's in the, the middle is a, a younger spruce. And on the right is the, the typical characteristic of balsam fir, which is the pitch blisters. If you were to puncture one of those little blisters, a little bit of pitch um, oozes out and you get that nice balsam fir smell. 
So now I think I'm done and uh, we can take a few questions. I just got a, a note that my internet's a little unstable, so I apologize for that. Um, let's see. Do you want me to read them for you? Colorado people? Blue Spruce. Do you think it'll do well in Vermont? Um, I've got them up. I can do it. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, yeah, I think Colorado Blue Spruce will do just fine in Vermont. Um, they're often sold as live Christmas trees, and I know my parents planted one probably 40 years ago, and it's about 40 feet tall now, so I think you'll do just fine with that. Um, what causes the huge burls on white spruce? It's a reaction to, uh, I'm actually not sure what that particular burl is a reaction to. Maybe David knows. Um, he's Sorry. Caitlin, <laughs> are you familiar with those? I think I've asked that question numerous times and never have gotten a really definitive answer. <laughs> so. You might hear a train whistle in the background, but uh, I've heard it's, I've been told that it's a, in relation to cold injury. Hmm. Oh, okay. Oh. Huh. That's interesting. All right. Well, that looks like it for the question. So over to you, Kaylin. Okay, great. Thanks, Peter. Well, I'll wrap us up tonight um, with going over some of the maples and eastern hemlock. So, Dan, if you want to thank you. Uh, so you can find all of these species growing at the Watershed Center in Bristol, which I live in Bristol. This is one of my place, favorite places to recreate. The original 664 acres uh, were conserved in 1997 with the Vermont Land Trust, and since then, the staff and board have uh, worked on adding two new parcels. Um, and now the entire forested parcel is about a thousand acres, um, which is great. Lots of trails there. You'll find two reservoirs that once supplied uh, the city of Regents with drinking water, an active beaver colony. And uh, there's a hibernacula for Eastern rat snake, which is a threatened species in Vermont. So fun place to go. Uh, sugar maple and red maple, I will say, are probably some of the most common species you'll find in the watershed center. Red maple is particularly dominant um, on the more poorly drained areas, while sugar maple, you'll find that growing well on the mesic, well-drained soils um, with a strong calcium component. We call those sweet soils. The hemlock uh, at the watershed center, you'll probably find it more along the streams and rocky ridges uh, where the soils are shallow. So hopefully you can get out there and visit. So next slide, Dan. So the, the maples, if you'll remember from mad, madcap horse, the maples like the ashes are oppositely branched, but as we know, sometimes the leaves are a bit far away. So we'll do a quick bark review. So as you see on the left of the slide is the young bark of sugar maple. Um, my, Michael Wotek, who wrote the book Bark, which I really recommend, uh, has what I found to be the best description um, is that in sugar maple, the surface has a subtle pattern to it that resembles old paint. Uh, as the tree grows, as you'll see as the pictures move right, the new layers of bark push out um, and the bark starts to develop vertical cracks. Um, and the, as the tree gets much older in the far kind of bottom right, these ridges can really develop and peel off of these long vertical uh, plates. So next one, Dan. And then we have red maple. So the bark of young red maple is smooth, so it doesn't have that old paint pattern. And as the tree ages, uh, the texture and the color of the bark changes and really starts to crack. And eventually those vertical cracks develop to form uh, multiple layers of long vertical plates. And on the, the kind of larger, older trees, those strips, you may see, may, may see them start to curl up uh, on, on both ends. And then the last maple I'll cover in, in detail is Norway maple. So as many of you know, this is not native to the U.S. By its, by its name. It was introduced from Europe and Western Asia. It's commonly planted as a street tree. We find it um, along this, the streets of uh, Bristol. And unfortunately, there is some Norway maple at the Watershed Center. Um, and, and as it has escaped it to the woods. And, and unfortunately, there it can outcompete sugar maple and some of our other native species. It's bark, it's smooth when it's young, as you see on the left, but it starts to develop these narrow vertical cracks that have this orangey tint to them. Um, and this, this pattern of narrow and, and sort of more shallow vertical ridges 
start to appear as the tree um, gets older and they, they intersect and it looks a lot like white ash. And so sort of the best trick, because of course, ash like maple are also oppositely opposite uh, branch has an opposite branching pattern. Um, you just look at the, the twigs and the branches and white ash has a lot uh, stout, more stout uh, branch branches. And that's kind of one quick way to, to differentiate the two if you can't quite see the bud. And so I'll go over some of the, um, the, the leaves of some of these maples. Um, and we'll do, if, for those of you that like to test yourselves, I'll wait to, to reveal what each of these are. So the first one, the top left, you'll see there's teeth along the edge or margin of the leaf and there's V-shaped sinuses. Um, the leaf stalks are usually red, which is your, your biggest hint there, which is Dan, this is red maple. Um, and so the one in the middle then to its right, um, it has a smooth leaf edge, so no teeth like red. It has U-shaped sinuses. And the center lobe, if you look at that center there, the, the sides of it are pretty parallel sided. So the U as in Dan sugar maple is a good, um, good reminder for that one. But then if you look at the leaf to the right of that, it looks a heck of a lot like sugar maple. Um, yeah, the leaves, if you look at the bottom, um, the leaves tend to be wider uh, with more prominent outer lobes at the base. But I would say the real telltale sign that you can tell um, that this isn't a sugar maple is if you break off the leaf, you'll see a white milky sap instead of a clear sap. And this is a, a, an indicator that you are holding in your hand a Norway maple. Um, you'll also see uh, out on the landscape in people's yards, you'll see leaves like this that are a red or crimson color. That's a cultivar of Norway maple called Crimson King. Um, and so at the bottom, I threw in another couple of maple leaves that just so you can differentiate the bottom left, you'll see there are three lobes. They have finely, uh, fine teeth. They're actually doubly toothed, uh, just like beech. Um, it looks like a goose. It's also called goosefoot maple. And this is striped maple. Uh, and then finally, the bottom right, you will see um, it has very deep sinuses. So those really cut into the center of the leaf. There's large teeth. And if we were to turn it over, you would see the underside is kind of a silvery white, which is, which is a good, um, good hint there that this is our silver maple. So if we move on to the next Next one, we'll look at some of these seeds. So these are Samaras, uh, paired seeds with wings, also called helicopters. Um, I know as everyone as kids has put them on your nose. Um, this, the wings cause the fruit to kind of spin rapidly in the air. So it is wind dispersed. Um, the fruit really varies in size, size, color, and the angle. Um, I won't go through the differences of each, but you can just see the difference. The main one, I think, which will be helpful for you to notice is Norway maple has a much wider angle than sugar maple um, and all the other uh, maples. It's, it's much bigger seed. And so that wraps up the maples. Uh, and so I will wrap up our evening with Eastern hemlock, which is an iconic species. It's one of my favorite trees. Uh, it's considered by ecologists to be a foundational species meaning it really exerts you know, significant control and influence on the characteristics of an ecosystem. All you have to do is hang out in the shade cast by hemlocks along streams and fully appreciates how, and, can, and then you can fully appreciate how cool it keeps those streams on hot summer days. Or just think of in winter, how much less snow there is um, under a hemlock grove. Hence, it's really you know, an ideal place for deer to find shelter and bed down during the winter. It's a very slow growing tree, long lived. I think there's records of it, you know, it can live uh, over 800 years. Uh, the bark folks may be familiar with was once a source of tannin used in the leather industry. Uh, Native Americans dry and grind the inner bark uh, for use as a flower, as a thickener or to stop bleeding. And it is the inner bark of hemlock is a favorite food of porcupines. So we move on to the next one. Um, so hemlock's superpower, I would say, is uh, lies in this, this dense overlapping pattern of branches that allows it to capture every bit of available sunlight it can. So you'll see the flat orientation of the needles um, in these kind of more close-up photos. Uh, the needles are, are sort of densely organized horizontally on the stem, which helps to maximize that surface area exposed to sunlight. 
uh, many of our trees will actually drop their lowered branches. We call this self pruning uh, when they become heavily shaded and instead they want to concentrate their foliage higher up where there's more available light. But because hemlock needles function so well in low light, uh, they can have a much deeper crown than, than a lot of other species. So it's kind of amazing. I said they have a superpower and they small hemlock trees can really hang out in a very shaded understory waiting for well over 80 years, um, in some cases for the sky above them to open up and release them um, from that shade. So you'll see the needles have a silvery underside. There are two white lines. Uh, the needles are, are very short, are rather short compared to some of the other uh, conifers and they're blunt. Um, unlike spruce, which is pretty sharp. Um, and Dan, if you want to go to the next slide, you'll see here is its, its growth form. It's a tall tree, you know, average 60 to 70 feet high. Um, it has really delicate um, drooping branches. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why it is really favored in the nursery trade. There are numerous cultivars that have been developed for this large graceful um, appearance, but there's also shrubs and dwarf trees that have been developed. So it's pretty common. Uh, you'll find it at nurseries. And, and then if you are looking just at the bark, um, then a couple things to, to note, you see on the tree on the left is sort of a younger, younger tree. The bark is sort of a reddish brown, in some cases reddish gray. It has roundish, somewhat irregular scales, but as the tree ages, these scales thicken and the furrows um, form that breaks the bark into these irregular sort of blocks. Um, if you were to sort of scrape off uh, one of these scales or a piece of the outer bark, you'll see this reddish purple color um, beneath, which is, you can see at various places on the, on the photos. And finally, um, the cones are tiny, really, compared to some of our other conifers, three quarters of an inch long. I think that's roughly the size, uh, if I'm remembering, Peter of black spruce. Here's a, a um, a uh, picture showing some of the other conifers that we've talked about tonight, just so you can see in comparison, the size sort of white pine to its left, a much bigger um, cone, white spruce to the right, uh, Norway spruce. I know we didn't talk about that, but that's a common one you'll see that's been planted in Vermont. That's up in the top right, just so you can get a, a sense of um, what are some of the other cones you might be seeing out there in comparison. So I will leave you tonight with this, um, this poem of Robert Frost. Um, and I think while, while we, um, while you all read that, maybe Peter, if there's any, um, yeah, uh, any yeah, questions? There's a couple questions. <clears throat> uh, Tim would like to know the term you used for a tree that exerts a strong influence over its environment. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I've read uh, called foundational species um, is one one word that I've used to to hear sort of hemlock uh, referred to. I don't know, Peter, Dan, or David, if you've heard it referred to. Is there other sort of terms that are used to describe hemlock? It's also been uh, I think it's been described as a keystone species. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Um, and Kay would like to know how you can tell the difference between hemlock and balsam fir. They look similar. They sure do. Yeah. So um, hemlock lace balsam fir it doesn't have those sharp needles like spruce. But if you turn a hemlock needle over, you'll see this silvery underside and these two white stripes. Um, fir, I think fir needles are a little bit longer than hemlock. Um, so that's another another um, kind of thing that you can you can compare. Um, let's see, Peter, what else, what else, how else would you describe the difference between hemlock and, and I think, spruce? And, and I think uh, the other thing that's, that's, uh, is a good one to, to look at is the balsam fir needles are attached directly to the twig. The hemlock needles have sort of a little bit of a green fleshy stalk that attaches mm -hmm. the needle to the twig itself. Well, that's a good one. If you see the needle going right onto the twig, that's balsam fir. Perfect, thank you. Uh, let's see. Michael would like to know, uh, what does Western conifer seed bug eat here in the East? I'm not sure if we have that here in the East. 
You know, I've seen it at my mother-in-law's in Albany, New York. It, it makes its way into homes. It's kind of a pest, but you know, Michael, I don't know what it eats. That's a good question. Um, I'll have to Google that a Dan or David or that either of you know what, what that eats out here. Oh, it's a new one for me. I don't. Um, let's see. And can any one of you recommend a site to see some of these species in Rutland County? I'm looking to teach some ID to Castleton University students. Uh, let's see. There's a there's a huge uh, state forest. I think it's called Bird's Eye State Forest. Um, it's fairly near you. It's something like 3,500 acres. That's a good spot. Um, let's see. Um, Peter, maybe while you're thinking of some, some other places, I know Kristen is talking or asking about, uh, places she can go, but that made me think that, uh, we really, uh, have to thank, uh, the Northern Forest Atlas for being a, a website that we're using to, to look at these species tonight. Um, Jerry Jenkins, the author and coordinator of that site has some really amazing, uh, photographs, and I, I think we may include a link to that in the in the follow up resources. But um, the Northern Forest Atlas is is a great web based um, location to, to to find some of these uh, images as well. Um, let's see. There's another um, state park over uh, right along Lake Champlain called the Narrows. And that one has, uh, I think, both the pines and some cedar. That's one of the most, one of the richest uh, state parks or par properties period in the state of Vermont. There's tremendous biodiversity there. And I guess you could just poke around on our recreation page and uh, look in your area, see where there might be some other places. That it's species out. Um, Kate has one more mystery tree for us, similar to the white spruce as far as how the needles are attached and are more spread apart and the stem is the same color as the needles and are about an inch long. So let's see. I, I wonder if it is maybe white spruce and the, um, the twig that you're looking at is the same color because it's new growth. The new growth on a, on a softwood tends to be sort of greenish color. Um, anybody else have ideas for Kate on that one? Could be an ornamental. Could be hard to tell. And Michael says that Mount Scutney has most of the conifers listed here all in one place. So thanks for that suggestion, Michael. Um, is there any kind of printed guide to natural areas of the Vermont Land Trust? You want to take that one? I don't. I don't think we have, I guess it depends on your, your definition of natural area. Um, I don't think we have, we don't definitely don't have a printed guide. Um, we did do a webinar on natural areas a few weeks back. If you go to our YouTube page, you'll um, be able to learn a little bit more about that. Um, do you, any of you have suggestions? I know the yeah, Nature Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy at one point printed their guide to their nature preserves. I don't know if they're, this was, gosh, five to 10 years ago that I saw it, um, but they, they also have a huge, you know, array of nature preserves around the state, which are also great places to do some botanizing. Um, Thanks, Caitlin. Um, and someone would like to know where to find old growth oaks in Vermont. I think the only place I know of is uh, Centennial Woods and uh, Shelburne Farms. Mm. Do you know of others, Kaylin or Dan, David? Mm -hmm. 
I'd have to check check on check in with Liz or something on that. Yeah, I, I don't know where there would be old growth. I mean, the the interesting thing about oak and some of these other species is because they grow so fast, they can be really large and impressive without um, being what might be called true old growth. They might just be um, older trees, um, and those can be found um, in in many places. But to really find um, I mean, old growth period is hard to find in Vermont. So um, to find old growth oak is even harder. Yeah. There is a great, Liz and David did a great webinar that you could find on VLT's YouTube page. And it's a tour of a lot of the old growth areas in Vermont. And so it, it you know, you can get a sense and then, you know, go searching there. I mean, you could, if, if any of them, David, that you sort of toured in the sort of Champlain Valley, uh, Southern Vermont, you might be more likely to uh, run into them there. Uh, but that's a good resource to check out if folks are really interested in um, finding those few old growth remnants. Right, and, and some of those are sort of old forest, you know, like Dan was sort of talking about, have large trees, haven't been cut in a long time too. So, but yeah, definitely check that out. Hey, well, I guess that's the end of our questions and we're at 8.15, so we've kept you a little long. Oh, wait, came up. Normally, uh, a comment mm -hmm. from Val, normally you can find old growth in areas that were difficult to access and log. That's true, Val. That's very true. You yep. look for uh, really steep um, brook and stream valleys, you can often find old growth hemlock in there. Okay, Caitlin, take it away. Okay, well, thanks everybody again for joining us tonight. This has been a fun hour talking about trees. Um, so you will receive an email with a short survey. We really take your uh, comments and feedback to heart. So please, if you have time, we'd appreciate if you would fill that out. We'll send in that email resources and then a link to this recording. And if you're interested, we have, uh, we're slowly moving into the realm of in-person events. So there's a couple offerings this August and September, um, and also a couple more online offerings um, coming up uh, listed below. So we hope uh, you'll join us and we appreciate uh, your support and uh, participation tonight and hope you have a uh, wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.